If a reasonable skeptic said that such things do not exist, he can only mean to say that they do not exist relative to his knowledge. Because, to deny the possibility of the existence of anything of which we know nothing, would imply that we imagined ourselves to be in possession of all the knowledge that exists in the world, and believe that nothing could exist of which we did not know. Franz Hartmann, Paracelsus and the Substance of His Teachings Join us tonight for episode 3 of Into the Portal, as we investigate the lore of the homunculus. Hello, and welcome back into the portal. I'm Andrew McKay. And I'm Amber Ray. So welcome back for part one of two mm-hmm. for this third episode of Into the Portal. Yep, we we're ended breaking up, it up. We ended up splitting it up, which is actually kind of funny because when we first started talking about what we wanted to do for episode three, we thought we would try to maybe choose something that we could maybe get into for an episode that yeah. was under an hour or something. A little, little lighter. But then sure enough, we were down well, the rabbit hole and of course. way too much to look into. So it's going to be a, our first ever two-parter, which is kind of fun. Yeah. So we have a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. Why don't you go for that there, Amber? Mm, not much to say, really. All I want to say is that we do have a bookstore up and running now. I'm uh-huh. super pumped on that. Yeah. Looks awesome. It's on the website. Visit intotheportal.com for all that good stuff. As well, I did want to give a shout out to Big Bruce 55 Thank you so much for your lovely review. That made me very happy. Yeah, our first ever Google Play review, which yeah. is cool. Yeah, yeah I was I'm, pumped. We're, yeah, we've been getting tons of great feedback. Lots of reviews on iTunes, but yeah, you can do them on Google Play Music as well, mm-hmm. which, is, which is great. Yeah. One other exciting thing we do want to mention right off the bat here in relation to the first bit, right, about the two parts. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so basically <laughs> in our second part... We're going to be having a guest expert in the field of alchemy. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so that will be with Travis J. Dow of the History of Alchemy podcast. Um, We first discovered him on, what was it? The uh, episode of Castle Holska with Astonishing Legends. Yeah. He he came on there for, I think it was that one where he came on for an interview. Mm -hmm. But he also does the Bohemian podcast too. Mm -hmm. So you might have heard uh, of him from there. Yeah. Podcast Nick is his uh, little group of podcasts and things, which is super cool. Mm -hmm. But yeah, History of Alchemy is awesome. You guys should go check it out. But we're going to bring him on for part two, which is, yeah, kind of the main reason why we split this up. So yeah, uh, we've got a lot of ton of content to get to in part one alone. And then we wanted his expertise for part two. So basically we're going to give you an overview and some background information, and then we're going to lead up to a teaser and then yeah next week we'll have uh, more information from travis so let's get into it Mm -hmm. so this episode is all about i mean it's it's roots are in alchemy but we are covering the lore the legend of the homunculus Mm -hmm. which if you've never heard of it before which i certainly hadn't before (laughs) i started to look into this and this was totally amber's idea and to be totally honest i was a little bit hesitant about it at first but as soon as i started to look into it i was like wow this is bizarre if this totally fits with what we do you didn't think we'd have enough content i didn't think we'd have enough content like, and sure enough here we are two two parts, two parts. pretty hilarious yeah. so the definition of a homunculus we're mm-hmm. just going to do just the basics here it is a latin term for little human little man uh, so ideally you know it's a, it's a fully formed miniature human like mm. emphasis on the like but um, they're artificially grown. Artificially grown miniature humanoid creatures that alchemists, tons of different recipes. All throughout the years, they've claimed to have made. But this is, mm. yeah, this has been a reoccurring thing for for millennium, really. Mm-hmm. So we're going to get into some of the background of it. Super cool story. Really bizarre. At first, I, think I was we like, should mention that there are some alternative conceptions. Like when you Google homunculus, you're going to see a whole bunch of models of the sensory organs of the human body things like big 
big old lips, big hands, big whatever. And that is mm-hmm. a completely different thing. Yeah, so so, don't in, the, get that so in the modern field of, of uh, psychology, I guess, that's, is, is where it came up, I believe. Right. So that's the idea of like your, your, the, the, the sensory perception and yeah. how it's linked to the brain and how it's mapped in the brain. Exactly. But we're getting into the ancient definition, the, the, the origin of the word mm-hmm. per se. So yeah, so let's, let's, I'm going to, I'm going to get right into that, into the background here. So what we came up with. the earliest example? Yeah. So like the, the earliest example that we could find was from something that's called the book of the cow, which if you try to Google that too, you're going to come up with a bunch of Egyptian texts for the book of cow, which is totally different. But if you slip in the, the, it's uh, it was a book by Plato. So it was a work from, from the Greek philosopher Plato who... I mean, it's sort of up in the air exactly when it was written, but it's somewhere in the 4th century BC, Mm -hmm. something like that. And this is supposedly the earliest reference that we we both found. That Mm -hmm. we found. So basically what this says, so they talk about the procedures for creating a homunculus, and there's a bunch of different recipes, like I just said. We're not going to get into the detail of all of them for the reason that it is really gross. Yeah, it's pretty disgusting. (laughs) It's pretty gross. Um, at least for the substances used that we know what they are. So, but I'll, I'll give a little (laughs) tip. And then there's all those very obscure ones and you're like, I don't even know what that is supposed to be. Dragon's teeth and stardust. Stardust. And those are kind of some questions that I definitely want to save for Travis for part two. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so the book of cow. So earliest reference And it basically says that there were, it references two different types of recipes. So all of the homunculus, it requires basically human bodily fluids. One of them being (laughs) semen. A lot of it. Mm -hmm. A lot of it. And then a different type of animal of some kind. So it's usually be like the womb of a cow. In the book of cow, they reference an unknown animal in one recipe and then another, the womb of a monkey. So they're not using glass jars yet. They're not using I guess glass, glass jars was yet. Was glass even a thing back then? It, they, the vessels were definitely different in the fourth century. I guess they were using clay pots back mm-hmm. then. Yeah, so they were still using an incubation of. They, they started that with animals. That makes animal. a lot more sense, hey? Like using yeah the womb of another biological yeah organism rather than just as opposed the... to a sterile jar. Yeah, totally. But essentially, what they're trying to do with all this and the idea behind alchemy itself is is transmutation. Yes. And that word carries a lot of baggage with it, I think, but really all it means is changing... Transmutation of matter, specifically. Right. right. Mm-hmm. So why don't you just give a little bit more on that, then? I mean, transmutation essentially wow. is That's just, pretty much all I got. Like, it's, it's a precursor to modern chemistry. Right. And a lot of the times it does get conflated with this um, <laughs> mythical transforming of, a lot of the times, metals into gold... As like the goal of all alchemists, which really was laughable by a lot of alchemists. Yeah, so, that's a stereotype. For it sure, really for is. Alchemy. Yes, mm-hmm. it wasn't just about that. And we're gonna we're gonna give some examples of how ancient yeah. alchemists really did contribute to modern chemistry. So it all really starts with Aristotle and alchemy. Okay. Well, that's what I found at least in the West, because there is a Chinese version of alchemy that definitely has different origins. Yep. Um, I have a quote here from John Leinhard or Leinhard from the University of Houston, and he says, quote, Alchemy originated when Aristotle took up an older idea that all matter combined the four elements of earth, air, fire, and water. He guessed that these elements could be changed or transmuted by the action of heat and cold, or dampness and dryness, end quote. Interesting. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so that's more of a, um, a practical definition. There were elements of Neoplatonism, like, and that kind of goes after the idea of it's something higher than the pursuit of um, matter, you know, right. like Platonism. He was a well, we should give a tiny bit. So Neoplatonism essentially that is, is it's, it's a it's a resurgence of uh, Platonic ideology, yeah. right? That originated with before. Plato. It, well, obviously, obviously, yeah, yeah, Greek <laughs> culture. And definitely, yeah, he had this idea that there was sort of like the the meta realm, right? Where right. things, like the the forms of things existed. I remember being in like Philosophy 101 and they were saying, I don't even know exactly how this went down, but they were saying like the form of a chair. They had this analogy with a chair. And I remember I just got so confused and this was my first little 
taste of, <laughs> of uh, yeah, of philosophy. And I just, I was like, hey, you know what? I don't know if this is for me. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I had paid more attention, though. It was my first year. Yeah, that might have been a little bit helpful. Eh? But anyways, yeah. So with Neoplatonism, it's more of a metaphysical, spiritual, or um, fi- uh, philosophical pursuit of right. knowledge and enlightenment, essentially. So yeah. anyways, those are all elements that played into um, pre-scientific revolution ideologies and, and all that. And so. Okay. Uh, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> Alchemy was definitely part of that sort of pre-scientific so, revolution. <laughs> so what else do you have there on Aristotle? Let's get some more, let's get a little bit more background on him. Because he is, I mean, obviously he came after Plato. Um, I mean, well, well, we'll get into him more later for sure, because he had some interesting thoughts on elements and the energies from the earth and the ideas behind nature and stuff like that. And that sort of ties into the ingredients and the things that were going into alchemical recipes and stuff like that, which yeah. I think is really cool. Well, Aristotle never directly um, referenced a homunculus or any recipe no. relating to a homunculus. No, he, he no, he did not. not. About that at no, all. he didn't. Ref- no, he he didn't believe in that. But he did believe in the idea that there were fully formed, like you just said, like a fully formed human man inside of a sperm. They, things like that. He believed in the. Right, the, so the animalcules yeah, theory. Yeah. And that goes into the preformationist theory, if I'm getting that correct. Yeah, I think that's... But anyways, we'll talk about theories later mm-hmm. on. We just want to get some more background, right, as yeah. to alchemy and, yeah, it's uh, early early authorities in the subject. Um, you had some information about a Gay Hong. Yeah, Chinese somewhere. alchemist Gay Hong. Mm-hmm. So this guy was really interesting because he, he came up with all kinds of things that were would later be, you know, pop up in like modern chemistry and things like that. But he he wasn't the typical alchemist. He, he wasn't didn't trying to Aristotle, hey? Uh, not from the stuff that I looked because he, at. They kinda had their own foundation, right? That's yeah, I mean just that he I was operating these. in the second century. So yeah, a couple hundred years or so, well, sorry, second century AD. So this is like, you know, six hundred plus yeah. years after Aristotle. I'm sure he took a lot from from the works of all those Greek philosophers for sure. But Basically, the th- the cool thing about Gay Hong was that he was, I mean, he was interested in gold, and he had a recipe for making mosaic gold, which is essentially like a type of like a gold flake kind of thing, and that's still mm. used today for like gilding things, so mm. picture frames and like mm-hmm. you know other jewelry and like things like that. So that's a good example of like a very you know early Ooh. alchemist and sort of a process that's still you know. Wasn't it, he the tinfoil guy? Yeah, he was. So that was another cool. thing too. He he ended, he created a type of tinfoil metal paper. You know, probably not exactly like the tinfoil you're, you're finding in your cupboard today. Mm-hmm. But he he did come up with this. Yeah, this this tinfoil metal paper, and this amazed yeah. people. It's this totally, blew people yeah, away. It's fascinating to think that people thought it was magic, right? Well, how could you not? Alchemy transformation. Yeah, exactly. Right. right I mean, yeah. it's like all of a sudden you have this this. Thin, flexible metal paper that you, you can, can wrap tear. Things you can in. literally it, tear it. Like a it's bizarre. If you had never it. seen something like that before, you'd be and blown away. And even paper itself, right? Like that was totally a crazy invention too. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. If you if you hadn't seen any of these things before, let's just do an episode on the history it's of gonna, paper. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, saying. we'll bring in Michael Scott as an interview. <laughs> We're definitely not gonna. <laughs> De- definitely. Oh, Michael Scott. You just. <laughs> yeah, the office reference. That's an there. office yeah. reference. Yeah, that just happened for sure. <laughs> but anyway, Gay Hong. So, but he was interested in a lot of things. So, the, the cool thing about Chinese alchemy, and I guess this crosses over into a lot of, into the Greek, you know, Greek philosophers and other branches of alchemy around the world, that it was philosophical and spiritual. Mm. And it wasn't necessarily just about changing something into something else. So, for Gay Hong, he practiced traditional Chinese medicine. He had, you know, his interest, his interests were spiritual and it, these are all things that were closely linked to alchemy, but -hmm. not directly. And so this Eastern philosophy of enlightenment and all these things was basically his version of the elixir of life, you know, and that's where the idea of taking that a lot of these alchemical stories like the homunculus and other things are more allegorical Mm -hmm. where his elixir of life, his philosopher's stone For Gay Hong, you know, it's not an actual rock that you find that you can live forever. It's the Mm. idea of transcendence, Mm -hmm. the idea of reaching this level of enlightenment. And that was the elixir of life. So it's just kind of a cool crossover between spirituality and then the material alchemical world. Huh. And that's kind of the line that we've crossed several times, right, in the course of our research. Mm -hmm. The idea of homunculus as an allegory versus an actual physical thing. 
And that, yeah, that's interesting that the elixir of life slash philosopher's stone can be thought of that way. I honestly, I was confused as to where this concept came from. And the earliest reference I got to any sort of form of an elixir or, yeah, like a immortality type substance, yeah. that type of thing. Um, the earliest known reference I got was actually um, from Greek mythology. Yeah. And it's not actually called the elixir of life or anything, but basically it's the food of the gods is how it's described. Okay. And it's this ambrosia and nectar. So ambrosia is the food and nectar is the drink of the gods. Apparently, um, oh, what's his name? Not Thor. Um, Achilles. Achilles heel. Oh, Apparently right. when he was yeah, born, that's... he was bathed in ambrosia. And it, it's a substance that comes from a magical horn of the goat Amalthea. So I'm assuming that's the type of marrow substance. It sounds like it would be something like that. Yeah, but again, that's very... <laughs> that can be just... You know, that's that's, very, it's that's a stretch. <laughs> I don't know how anyone would find this magical goat and how they would suck this substance out of it. But uh, anyways, yeah. But that's the story of alchemy to me. It's that it really there's is, a bunch yeah. of a bunch of um, ingredients and different things used in all kinds, not just for the homunculus, but all kinds of things that we can look to and say, okay, we know how that that uh, element behaves now, or we know what those combinations do now. But then there's references to all these things that we don't even know what they were. I mean, yeah, you can say magical goat. What does that or, even mean? Or dragon's bones and blood. Exactly. What does that mean? Are they getting dragon kimono dragon bones on the black market from the from the near, near east? Or, are they, or is this like an actual cryptid creature that has been... Or is it something that is sold as like ground up dragon bones, but literally it's just flour or exactly. something. Like so it could be like anything. That. That's, that's, that's the interesting thing is there's all these sort of bizarre ingredients with no, no specifics behind them. So my next story actually, well, not story, but my next person, mm-hmm. um, just going into early alchemy. Are you done with Gay Hong or? Yeah. I mean, yeah, but he was just a really good reference for, for, alchemists for that really early early alchemy, alchemy that was just focused on more legit like trial and error in chemistry yeah it came up with tinfoil i mean gunpowder was a product of alchemy right, right. like the chinese came up with gunpowder that was you know maybe er- that's stardust could be the earliest <laughs> reference know. to gunpowder was in the second century ad from what from what i looked at so that was the same era as gay hong so definitely a lot of things that came out of alchemy that were beneficial mm-hmm. to science and to humanity I mean, maybe not gunpowder per se <laughs> definitely led to a lot of negative things but yeah no it's really cool Lots so of- leading into that because we want to go chronologically eh? we're trying to a little bit yeah <laughs> so we've gone plato to aristotle to gay hong even though he's not actually associated culturally no um my next person is zosimus of panopolis mm-hmm. um who was an egyptian alchemist so he was around circa 300 AD, approximately. I couldn't find an exact date. Okay. But basically this guy, um, I have a quote here from a Fate Magazine article, um, where Zosimus apparently described how an artificial man could be made by the use of dragon's bones, blood, and the Philosopher's Stone. So, the trifecta. The trifecta. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> yeah. And a lot of people have um, that, that reference... Is a little iffy. I wasn't actually able to find that exact um, passage in another source, which in my academic brain is just like red flag. (laughs) Totally. But anyways, it was very interesting. And I did come across some theory um, from Carl Jung, actually. He actually... This is a bit confusing because, like, he... In the visions, there was this Visions of Zosimus, which was written by the guy, and it was a philosophical text. And then he has several dreams and, like, dream visions and things like that. And... In Carl, this article I read by Carl Jung, he never actually referenced an explicit um, recipe. So there is a bit of, yeah, discrepancy there. But basically, um, Carl Jung, he goes with the more metaphorical um, or allegorical explanation. about What era was he around in again? I mean, he was... Oh, he was the the same era as... Carl? No, God, no. He was early 20th century uh, contemporary of... Freud. Oh, I'm mixing them up. Oh, yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah, they were the two, you know, um, psychoanalytic That's right. psychologists. That's right. Anyways. How could I forget that? But yeah, so that was his, Carl's take on it. Um, there's others that have kind of said that Zosimus was inspired by the myth of Cadmus in Greek mythology, okay. which I found really cool. So the what? story goes here um, that this guy, Cadmus, he was the son of Ag- Agenor, the king of Tyre. 
tire. <laughs> I don't know, tear tire. The King of Canadian tire. King of Canadian tire there, but <laughs> anyways. So yeah, the story goes that um, this guy, he had a sister who was essentially kidnapped by Zeus. And um, in retaliation, I guess his, his mom and dad basically withered into nothing because they were just devastated over this loss. Mm. And so um, Cadmus, he decides to go looking for her. And anyways, he soon, how the story goes, this is a quote here, um, Cadmus went looking for them, so Zeus and uh, his sister Europa, Mm -hmm. and soon came face to face with an enraged dragon. Cadmus attacked the malevolent monster and after a fierce struggle managed to slay it. He then sacrificed the cow, the cow, that's weird that he refers to it as the cow, anyway, sorry, (laughs) who told him um, to get the teeth of the dragon and plant half of them in the ground. As soon as Cadmus did so... A host of fierce warriors appeared out of the ground, and before Cadmus could engage them, the armed men began a ferocious and bloody battle amongst themselves. <laughs> That's not very effective. No, that seems counterintuitive. But yeah, a lot of people take that as um, as sort of the um, the inspiration for this awesomeness. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Very cool side note. That I is thought. a cool side but note. But that's interesting, hey? You can just sew teeth into the earth and humans pop up. That reminds me of like the orcs from Lord of the Rings, yes. right? Where they grow yes. out of the mountain. Yes. And it also actually brought to mind um, the Mandrake. From Harry Potter. Mm-hmm. There's so many. And also the Mandrake <laughs> did exist outside of Harry Potter. Oh, of course. Lore, just so everyone's Well, obviously aware, Harry but... Potter's only been around since the, <laughs> right? the last But a lot years. of people think like, oh, J.K. Rowling came up with all that on her own. Nope. Nope. I mean, fantastic books and movies, but yeah, no, but yeah, so many, I mean, there's, there's other cool references in Harry Potter to alchemy too. Hey, like, um, I think Albertus Magnus is referenced in Harry Potter and there was another, another, uh, one of those books. Well, um, Nicholas Flamel, Nicholas Flamel, he was based off a real person. I can't remember if that was his real name or not though. Anyways, read a little, little side note about that. There's alchemy in all kinds of popular culture. That's for sure. (laughs) So... I have one more early alchemist. Let's hear it. It's a very, very, very short side note, but a lot of people will know him if they're familiar with alchemy at all. Um, his name is Jabir. I'm totally going to butcher this. Jabir. Oh my God. Try your best. Try your best. <laughs> Jabir Ibn Hayyan. <laughs> it's I-B-N. So I'm like, Ibn. Ibn. Anyways. Ibn. So he was around between 721 to 815. And so he was one of the earliest known near alchemists. So within that culture, I can't remember if he was in Turkey. He was somewhere around there. But um, he was one of the first in that region. Okay. And people kind of, he took up a lot of the same ideas and continued on with Aristotle. So he definitely, um, yeah, he thought the idea of the four elements and the um, hot, dry, wet, cold processes were like, yeah, his basis for understanding alchemy. Um, and basically, yeah, there is a reference in Islamic alchemy to this certain goal um, of this artificial creation of life in the laboratory up to and including the human. So again, really, they don't call it a homunculus as far as... This was from the World Heritage Encyclopedia, by the way. Interesting. But um, yeah, definitely all this will be in our show notes. Yeah. Um, I just thought that was interesting. Yeah, just a very early reference. I never found any explicit recipes again from this guy, but he was just continuing on with the trend, hey? Just... Yeah. Yeah. And that was the only version of scientific chemistry that they knew of, so... To yeah, me, that's there's all a there lot was. of legitimacy there. Like they're pioneers. Well, that's man. the thing. I mean, alchemy gets just gets a it's it has a certain connotation to it. People think of it in relation to the stereotypes, creating gold, creating the elixir of life, all these kinds of things. But really, it was just a term that you know designated to people who were experimenting with stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, you're experimenting with different elements. You're experimenting with whatever. And you know that sort of jaded perception we have of them might have been a result of the slight anger of the status quo of academia at that time, right? Because if you're pushing these boundaries and you're going down rabbit holes, so to speak, and and maybe not using all the kosher ideas of the time, whether it's religious or, or otherwise, you know what I mean? Like Yeah, well, definitely. They were unorthodox. Yeah. What I'm trying to well, get and at, as soon as things started to shift into the, yeah, the, the, the era of empiricism after, uh, the, that, like, the Baconian mm-hmm. p- empiricism or whatever, people people don't like to have their 
results, you know, they don't, they don't want to have anybody that's not related to science contrasted with their work. So alchemists, you know, moving into the 17th, 18th, 19th they centuries, the they were, yeah, they were the heretics, <laughs> even though really it's just like, okay, they were just the people that were taking a few things that maybe more mainstream scientists weren't willing to experiment with. Yeah, for the sake around. of their careers, perhaps. There's so many well, academics you see that today. today. Yeah, totally. Where right? people are like, I'm not going to oh, do. Oh, not touch that with ten foot pole because right? nope, it's well, my career. Even online. for me, like... I've ta- I've I've mentioned like the idea of of uh, pre-Columbian contact theories, like mm. when we were at university, and I'd bring that up with professors, and they'd be like, Oh, I'm you know like really fascinated with about that, especially in the anthropology mm-hmm, department. Mm-hmm. Really fascinating. But if you spend a ton of time and publish a publi- paper yeah, on exactly, that, yeah. people are going to look, look down their nose at you. Oh yeah. So. Definitely, the that is something that would be coming up in culture. the in the 16th, 17th centuries too, for yeah, sure. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Mm-hmm. But I'm glad there's people out there that are still willing to try the bizarre, and right? we just get to talk about it, which is kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just try making a homunculus. <laughs> I guess we could, although we find I... Some uh, ingredients. <laughs> I don't know. We have, I mean... W- the we, belly of a sow, or just a glass jar, I guess we can use that as our... We've seen a bunch of horse manure... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, do you want to give one of those stories? Do you have any of well, those queued up? Well, that's kind of where I feel like this is leading. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so since we've covered, yeah, a couple early alchemists leading up to, yeah, this is basically like what we would refer to as the Dark Ages if you're just being really like, you know, blanket coating. Yeah. Really wasn't Dark Ages. No, it wasn't. That was just the term because it was, there wasn't a ton of good, great record keeping. Exactly. And it's not as if there weren't arts and there weren't whatever. It's hilarious, right? Like when you're in... You think it's High just school, chaos, you and like you're just like everything. The weather was always terrible, right? Plagues <laughs> everywhere, was, disease, yeah. famine. Oh my god, you can't but, do anything. No, there was a massive flourishing of arts and mm-hmm. uh, and, and and sciences too, Al- alchemy too, for sure. Yeah. So, anyways, moving on from that. Yeah. So we're moving into basically the High Middle Ages. So this is pre-scientific revolution still. Mm-hmm. Um, this period spans between 1500s to mid 1700s yep so one of my favorite homunculus stories goes with these two austrians their names were abe jeloni mm-hmm. and count kufstein count and, kufstein um, both of them were pretty shady characters uh jeloni was apparently a supposed mystic and rosicrucian which we'll get into in the second part yep and as well count kufstein was a freemason so anyways there's people that. definitely don't trust freemasons I don't really. Like, <laughs> it's you funny. Know? You can go on their website and you're like, oh, you really don't have much to hide, but you're very obscure still too. Very like mysterious. I saw some photos from their Facebook, the Ohio branch Facebook account. Mm-hmm. Very odd. Yeah, it's obscure. It's very They're strange. wearing these white gloves. You're like, what is that? Anyways. Yeah. Just wash so, your hands. Why do you need the gloves? <laughs> Purity! Purity! Anyway, no, I don't think they're pure. So. No, no, no. <laughs> um, anyways, so yeah, this was in 1775. So this is a little later. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> This is a later account. And apparently, um, Count Johann Fernadan von Kufstein, together with this Abe Jeloni, um, who was an Italian cleric, slash mystic, slash Rosicrucian. Um, I mean, those are just labels. I mean, like... They are. Like, no, this, people, is, this is just rumors. Yeah, these people these not... people were labeled whatever... Whoever opposed them wanted to label <coughs> them, right? Mm. So, just, just to say, because I don't want it to sound as if... <clears throat> stories behind because a lot of these people who claimed to and we're going to get into that in part two uh in even more detail with some of the people more modern era who have claimed to have created homunculus they're reputable people or they knew reputable people and then they have this weird mention or a blurb and you're just like what right. <laughs> okay so there's these links and associations with very reputable people in society and european mm-hmm. culture and things like that it's very bizarre anyway continue so these two have reportedly created a court of homunculi. So this is 10 homunculi. And <laughs> they all one. were in glass containers, apparently kept at Kufstein's Masonic Lodge in Vienna. Oh, yeah. I remember reading And there that. is a German, um, I don't know what his actual, he's a doctor of some sort. He's got a PhD or whatever. Anyways, his name is Emil Besent, Besetzi. And uh, <laughs> he wrote Die Sphinx, which actually has a more... Um, detailed chapter relating to this account, yeah. but I couldn't find an English version. So if anyone can find that for me, that'd be great. We'll have to wait for our friend Josh to come come home oh, and yeah. you can translate it. Come home from Japan. Yeah. God. <laughs> Anyways. Um, yeah, so these two, they created a whole court, including a king, a queen, a monk, a nun, a seraph, which I'm not even sure what that is, 
an architect, a miner, and two more ambiguous things called a blue spirit and a red spirit. The blue spirit reportedly, these were just like colors that would kind of like float in the liquid of the jars. And then you would, apparently you would wrap on the seal of the jar, which was a, an oxen bladder, and you would speak in Hebrew. So this is very esoteric, right? Totally. Getting into that. Well, and there's, there's a bit and, behind um, that. Yeah. Keep yeah. Going. So the red spirit was apparently very um, satanic and it basically was like the devil's face would appear. And, um, and in the blue jar, the blue spirit was very angelic. So it's almost like, yeah, bipolar. Good and evil. Bi- yeah. Right. But these, the, the coolest part about this story to me was that these 10 homunculi were produced under questionable circumstances Whatever. obviously they were in glass jars they did have some sort of biological ingredients in the jars and they were buried under horse manure for i can't remember how many weeks i think it was six weeks i think that's and then by the time good. they re like unearthed them they were about six inches tall and each one the funnest part about this is that each one of them they're almost like metahumans because like they were able to predict things about the future and they had their own they were specialists they had this knowledge that they would basically how it was relayed was that basically um kufstein would take these to his masonic meetings and they would spout off knowledge and all these crazy like you know wonderful wisdoms about the world and it was all highly specialized so things like the king he would only talk about politics the monk would talk about religion, and same with the nun, I guess. The architect would talk about buildings and all the wonderful... Anyway, so right. all these, they all had their own little niche of knowledge, yeah. and I just thought that was so cool. That is so fascinating. It's, biz- it's bizarre. It is bizarre. And so anyways... You know, well, yeah, but it's really fascinating. That's what we're all about. Totally. And it was so interesting, and apparently um, they weren't happy with the size of them, and so they ended up burying them again for another six weeks, and when they unearthed them... They were approximately 12 inches. They're almost too big for the jars after that. And the cutest part, I, I keep saying this, but anyways, <laughs> I just love the story so much. Um, the king was apparently just smitten with the queen and would always try and get out of his jar and, and go and climb in hers, like be together. And it was this whole funny thing. But that kind of doesn't make sense because they do have other accounts where, because um, the jars would have to be cleaned, right? The wa- They were kept in yep. water, essentially. Yep. And the jars would be cleaned, like, every week, every two weeks, that type of thing. Unless it was the red spirit. It had to be cleaned, like, every, like, two or three days. Or else it just stank, apparently. Interesting. But, yeah. So, when they were cleaning these, they would obviously take the little guys out. And uh, and they would faint. They would just be very... They would basically just look like they were just, like, going down to sleep and dying, essentially. But, hmm. yeah. And then when they were put back in, they were revitalized. And so, they had to live in water. That's weird. They're aquatic humanoid beings. Miniature humanoids. Well, that's just it, though. It's like they're they're like the descriptions are humanoid, but they're they're not. They're definitely not human. Mm-hmm. And I, of course, with that story, it's like you can see the allegory <clears throat> everywhere. Like for modern culture, right? Like even the relationships between you know king and queen, and the the you know the the hierarchy of the court and things like that. Right? Yeah. But, but it's just it's a bizarre allegory. It's though. weird. It's what like I'm why trying to would picture... you? Because, like, I know we watched that little brief um, thing on The Bride of Frankenstein where they actually, if you YouTube it, we'll have it in our show notes as well. Mm-hmm. If um, you go and search that up, um, you basically get a scene where, oh, it's not Frankenstein. It's, like, his master is showing him his his creations. And it's basically homunculi. And he pulls out these jars. And they're fully dressed, fully formed um, miniature humans, like, the the king's wearing a full, like, you know, getup that a king yeah. would wear and same with the queen and all that. So in my <laughs> mind, I'm trying to picture this with Count Kufstein and all them, right? Yeah. Like, were these things clothes? Like, were they... Like, that's were they the weird part. Like that, little but, outfits but See, them? that's the part where I feel like it. it's... There's... I mean, there's embellishment with every historical story, mm-hmm. right? Whether or not this is completely made up and it's 100% allegorical... For the, I mean, this is just one specific story, and mm-hmm. we'll get into a few other accounts of homuncula. Whether or not it's completely 100% allegorical, I can't really say. It's a bizarre allegory, if that's the route you're going. But it's, if, right? Like, why this, would you say that you've this done this? In this specific account, it does not translate as that at no, all. No, no. And in Emile Besetny, Besetny, anyways, 
in his Die Sphinx, which is actually a Masonic handbook, by the way. Okay. Um, yeah, so he devotes an entire uh, chapter to the subject, and he details numerous accountable persons that were able to testify to having seen this homunculi from right. the Masonic um, chapter themselves. Right. So people like Count Max Lamberg and Count Franz Joseph von Thun are both given as uh, reputable examples. So is there people just that this? this? I mean, and if there's, if there's going to be any group of people that are going to be able to have passed down some sort of esoteric knowledge throughout the centuries, it would be within the depths of Freemasonry. Mm, and that's the part about that. all this that's the most interesting to me, because at first when you brought this up, I'm like, that sounds ridiculous. I don't know if I want to mm-hmm. do a full episode mm-hmm. on that. Maybe we can do a mini episode, but you we know what? We need to contextualize There it. is a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we and, and I think we've done a good job of that so far, mm-hmm. giving the background, but it's just, it doesn't make sense to me that all of this would be allegory and just the fact that there's ingredients that we don't understand and the idea that, yeah, when we transitioned into an era of science and all these alchemists got shunned, you know, knowledge got lost. There could have been some, some something, there's a disconnect. Mm. When well, we're, you even when made look- the comment about that Library of Alexandria that one time. Right? Sure, oh, yeah, like that. there could have been references so to all kinds of different, yeah. There, that lot, what, yeah. If, what if all the secrets of the pyramids were in that library? And were they gone? probably, <laughs> probably some gone. of them probably were in there. Probably. And, and like, and yeah, they're gone forever. We'll never know. Or, well, not necessarily. We might, un- you know, you never yeah. know. You could unearth things later on, but... It's all strange, man. It's, it's all, all bizarre. super bizarre. And another funny part about this account that I thought kind of related to um, current models and attempts at making a homunculus was the, I, the account of the death of the monk. Right. So the homunculi that was the monk, um, af- this was after Jeloni had departed from Kufstein's company, but apparently one day Kufstein was carrying the jar of the monk and it shattered on the ground and the monk died and he was devastated, buried him in the backyard, that type in the garden. And he wasn't able to reproduce him without Jeloni. And basically how it was described uh, that his attempts at making another one failed and resulted in a leech like thing that died shortly. That reminds me of some of the things we've seen on some YouTube videos lately. <laughs> yeah, we've watched a, a few YouTube videos. There's some modern, modern, I'm doing air quotes, you can't see it because we're podcasting, mm-hmm. um, alchemists yeah. that have been attempting to recreate homunculi. Well, alchemists, like that one Russian guy, and yeah. then skeptics, people that are just yeah. taking a more, like, uh, an approach that we would take, right? And being like, okay, let's, let's just do this from a scientific standpoint. There was one guy totally. I came across, he was trying to use, like, chicken eggs and duck eggs and yep. i can't remember what he was actually if he was infusing it with sperm or he, was, he was yeah I, I saw that one too yeah it was yeah. semen and uh and the, that and one the, with the blood whole... though or something yeah yeah the, well blood's incorporated oh, i think so blood gross. is incorporated in all the recipes not I, all of them. I, i'm most of them i mean it's either a, it's either incorporated in the combination at the beginning or it's a f- you feed it with blood mm. so that's 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 one of the common yeah i saw things. several accounts that were like after you bury it and everything then you have to basically um baste it in a disgusting mixture of all these biological and organic fluids and, and i feel like that is the obvious reason why like and that was the reason why i was so hesitant to do this show even because I, I the gross you know, you look at it and you're like okay this sounds ridiculous obviously these things aren't real it never existed I, but yeah. when you start to dig deeper and you look at yeah, okay, and you're looking at all these references saying, oh, it's just 100% allegorical, or it's 100% this, 100% that. But then there's so much that we don't know about mm-hmm. things they were using or what type of esoteric knowledge was passed on. You can find that, it, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can dig that up in any topic. How were the pyramids built? You know, the Coral Castle in Florida, how the heck did that guy build the place? You know, how, how were certain things done? You know, and it ties into religion too. I mean, you mentioned uh, earlier, like... Um, like Aristotle took a lot of his influence from Egyptian alchemy. Is that what you mentioned? I think was the connection. Um, yeah. Like ancient, 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 um, Egyptian culture and then ancient, ancient Greek, like pre-Greek culture. Right. And um, ancient Jewish culture in the, in the Kabbalah, the Kabbalah. Mm-hmm. you know, they, they, some of the, some, the Jews were some of the best alchemists. They, they, you know, they were, they were scientists. They were in this, you know, pursuit of knowledge for sure. And some yeah. of it was learned from Egyptian alchemists, like while they were obviously in Egypt and then eventually moved out of Egypt with mm. Moses and all that jazz. But there's definitely ties to not only ancient alchemy, but religion as well. And the idea that it's not just tied into spirituality, but I mean, even yeah. Jesus is almost even like a reverse homunculus in that story, right? right? The virgin birth. So mm-hmm. a lot of these things are tied into 
the idea of homunculi, the idea of creating life from yes. matter. Creating life from matter in non non typical typical ways yeah. non-bio and, and 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 yeah like so like today we look at like the ingredients used and it's like that's insane like there's no way but then we we're like the, missing the, we're, the, the context is, is gone for example what is the arcanum of human blood the arcanum like is that the plasma I don't know. what the heck is that what Anyways. is stardust Right? Is that an asteroid from <laughs> this is where a we meteor need that's Travis. crash landed? <laughs> so yeah, this is why we're stoked to bring on Travis from the history yeah. of alchemy for part two. But these are just these are things to me that don't people people that's the thing about modern science and, and empiricism and all that. It's like we 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 see something empirically, so that's how it is, right? Well, that's just even. Um, I read an interesting article the other day about, um, oh my gosh, who was it? It was Michu Kakao, I think, Kaku, I think her, his or her name was, a physicist. Um, and they have a book called Physicist of the Impossible. And they basically were making the point that like our society today is kind of bound by the measurable, the visible. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, the rationalized version of everything. Like, you know, and he made the point too. He went into um, the idea of dark matter as it is weighable. So it is measurable, but we right. can't perceive it. No. But it makes up 23% of our universe. No. So it's yeah, very it, strange. It's a, it, so it's, you need you need a bit of both, yeah. right? You can't... It's almost like, yeah, we rely on science as our objective reality. When is there such a thing? Is science our new religion of this Well, it, it totally culture? is. I mean, it comes down to the idea of epistemology, like your way of knowing. Mm-hmm. And th- that ties into this for me. That's massively <laughs> because there's right? this whole idea that we can try to pick apart things from the past and if you're looking at something from the 17th century it's more recent than 500 bc obviously but the point is is that context change the lens the lenses in, in which we see the world changes. change yeah mm-hmm. legitimacy changes and the ways of knowing change so we transitioned to, into an era of empiricism and scientific knowledge, mm-hmm. and that's how we see the world. But that's the whole idea behind esoteric knowledge, that there, that there are there things are out there. There's things they, out there yeah. that we can't explain today in 2018. Mm-hmm. And maybe some of those things were explained or could have been explained in a different context and through a different lens millennium ago. Mm-hmm. Because the epistemology was different. The, we, we could see things differently. And you're now throwing we out can't... big words there, just FYI. Well, I did the de- definition. I mean, your way of knowing. Epistemology just means your way of knowing something, mm-hmm. essentially, in broad strokes. It's kind of funny. Even just saying that and having such a basic definition, it's like, sure, way of knowing. Some people might think of an ideology as their way of knowing. But no, an ideology is something you subscribe to that right. you're more conscious of. Right. Your epistemology is something below the conscious level. It, yeah, it like informs, literally. It our... informs how you know what you know right. and why you know it. Right. Gets so. into kind of, yeah. Foucault, Anyways, if you want to pick up a get... Michel Foucault book, uh, what was the one we read? In uh, our... The Order of Things. Yeah, that was a really cool read. Very cool. It took me like five times uh, through to really pick up And then up once you finish a chapter, down. you literally look at the beginning of the chapter, you're like, I yeah, you gotta reread each page like five times. Yeah, pretty much. But it's very interesting because it definitely ties into this. I mm-hmm. mean, there's things that ancient peoples knew that we just simply don't today. And I think that might tie into some of the ingredients and things used in ancient And, alchemy. you know, that's a nice little um, segue into, um, yeah, our sort of, our our last, well, we're not really going to get into Paracelsus. Just wanted to give him a brief mention before we wind down well, for part he, one. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because he, this guy was a, per, or, yeah, he was a pioneer in medicine. He did do a lot of, um, yeah, breaking down those barriers and sort of expanding horizons of medicine. Mm-hmm. Credit of being, bringing laudanum to Western medicine after travels abroad. And he was just, I don't know. He was a little bit of a, a maverick, I would say. Paracelsus is going to be a focus for part two. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he will be. He was a prominent alchemist of his time. Um, a theorized. Oh, he was the inspiration for Rosicrucianism too. A lot of people. Yeah. So part two, we're going to get into the details behind Rosicrucianism, and and I, Freemasonry and Freemasonry. The connections to homunculi and alchemic. Al, alchemic. Ah, oh, I can't talk. Right alchemical. Now. Alchemical <laughs> knowledge forms. That's like right. Things. And a bunch of the other modern alchemists that kind of tie into this story of the homunculi. Yeah. And obviously our interview with Travis Dow. Yeah. Lots to look forward to. But for now, we'll leave you with this from Franz Hartman.
A person who preemptorily denies the existence of anything which is beyond the horizon of his understanding, because he cannot make it harmonize with his accepted opinions, is as credulous as he who believes everything without any discrimination. Either of these persons is not a free thinker, but a slave to the opinions which he has accepted from others.